Today, we're going to have a look at the successes, the failures, the future, and the implications. So I had hoped to uh, be across in Cape Town this week, uh, attending Africa Oil Week and uh, possibly even staying for Africa Energy Week next week. Two great conferences uh, really discussing the way forward for oil and gas and renewables throughout the continent of Africa. Unfortunately, um, just a little bit too busy at the minute. So what I'd like to do tonight instead is to uh, uh, basically, for those who couldn't make uh, the various Cape Town conferences, let's have a look at what's happening um, throughout Africa. And all this week, um, we're going to be looking at different parts of Africa. Uh, we did the Eastern Mediterranean um, region and uh, Egypt uh, in yesterday's video. Today, we're going to take a long, hard look at Namibia and the latest well results. So first up is the Nara 1. Now, NARA-1 is located to the west of uh, Venus, the Venus Discovery, and uh, it has been declared just very recently as a dry hole. Now, we'll come back on that. It's, uh, we think, a very significant result. At Venus-1A, there's been an appraisal well, uh, which was successful, and it's yet to flow test. So that's Venus-1A. At Venus-1X, there's been DST success. So, so far, Venus shaping up very well. Some head scratching and uh, pencil sharpening to be done with the NARA 1X result. What next? Well, Total Energies will operate uh, two rigs, uh, two rig operation going forward, and it's expected that's going to be a, a combined appraisal and expiration program. There's going to be 3D shot, effectively to give coverage over the entirety of both blocks. And you can see here a number of prospects here outlined in a Total Energies press release. If we look at the shell block to the east of uh, Venus, this is where the first discovery was made, uh, Graph 1X, and it was uh, a great success and a play opener for the basin. After that, Larona 1X was drilled, and it was both a successful exploration leg and an appraisal of the Graph discovery, we understand. And Yonka 1, we'll have a look at that on a cross-section in just a second, a great success. Lissetti 1X, well, we kind of reading between the lines, we think that was only a moderate success, and it's not really proven to be a, a commercial success at this time. And right at the north end of the block here within this uh, region, uh, you can see we've got the Cullinan 1X, which has been described as, as a dry hole. Now, this is a very significant result, and certainly we need to understand the significance of the Cullinan and Nara dry holes in this region. We also understand that there's been somewhere between uh, seven and eight additional wells have been granted permits for drilling. Here's a section um, looking at the Yonka one well and its relation to, uh, to Graf. Now, within this section, there's a lot of information. If we look at it in a little more detail, we can see the synrift and the drift sequences here shown on the stratigraphic column to the left. You can see Yonker and Graf. Kudu, kind of reservoir here in the sort of the Bohemian, the synrift sediments. We also see this dark green. This is the uh, the source rock. It's uh, Aptian to uh, Turonian in age. We can see that it's sort of a condensed sequence here in the offshore. Quite a thick, well-developed and ultimately mature source oil source rock. So this is a very interesting area. And then you can see the AJ Raben to the west and Iboese, a gas discovery here in the, uh, in the drift sequence. Pause the video and have a look at this cross-section in more detail. Here's a graphic taken from GeoExpro, and you can see this is uh, Duncan McGregor, basically showing that uh, here we have in the north uh, of the South Atlantic region, the sort of the Aptian salt basin, just north of the Walvis Ridge. Uh, we can see that that's always been well known, but now what we're seeing is that this southern region here looks like uh, there was a silled basin uh, and an oxic area back in Aptian times and, and this would have been where the source rocks would have developed. Now it's sort of set up by this sort of volcanic centre here, the Aguaeus um, fault system which kind of comes through here and is a sort of a transcurrent fault system basically just off the south coast of South Africa. Now looking at Chevron's block Pell 90 some six prospects identified in this region here. There's a 3D survey was shot in Q1 2023, and it's anticipated that drilling will commence in Q2 2024. 
Moving across to the Galt block, PAL 83, some three to four prospects identified in this region here. Perhaps in the light of the Cullinan well, the risk of, for these expiration prospects needs to be revisited and, and re-looked at. Uh, presumably, if there's been a pre-trade here of the well data, then some kind of dry hole analysis is needed. But there's going to be two wells drilled here. These wells are currently expected to be drilled in Q4 2024. The block to the north, PEL 87, well, that's the uh, Saturn Superfan. Now, it's a huge area, and this has been talked about for, for quite some time. And this is a look at some material here that was recently been put out on the internet. And we can see here's the size of the Saturn Superfan. It's Pan Continental, I think, mapped this up. And you can see within that, here's this area of the Saturn fan. Now, there's a comparison drawn with the sizes of Venus, with Marlin in deepwater Brazil, and also in Jubilee offshore Ghana. So a very, very sizable prospect here. Now, we can see, or it has been broken out, and we can see that there's maybe uh, several leads that actually constitute sub-areas of the fan. So we've got leads A through H. And uh, as a single trap, it looks to be of the order of, you know, 1.3 to 2.8 reserves expectation, though there's a huge range on that from 250 million barrels of oil up to uh, 7.8 billion barrels of oil, which is, is quite a range, but it is expiration and there are uncertainties. So here's a couple of seismic lines. Um, these come from, uh, well, they're published in GeoExpro, but uh, they actually come from Shearwater and from Searcher. And if we uh, have a quick look at some of the features on this particular slide, we can see that in red here, we have these deeply incised uh, erosional channels, it seems, and potentially there's some kind of fill in there, which may be causing a bit of a pull up. So it looks like uh, potentially some low velocity fill within these channelized sections. In the caption below, it says, these are indications of migrating fluids. And uh, for, for section A here, it says, uh, West East seismic section through pockmarks up seabed. Now, they are shown here, these features. It, it does rather look like it's some kind of a gravity slide, actually, that's going on in here. Now, this is erosional. This looks to be that part of the shelf has actually collapsed and slumped down towards the uh, seaward direction. And uh, there are sort of pockmark type things. They may be these uh, disturbances that you see going down to some depth. And on this time section here, it may be that these are these uh, circular uh, bodies. Now, we don't have the seismic, but the this feature here does look to be some kind of uh, slumping or a landslide in effect and, and a redeposition, which is what we we suspect this might be now. One line interpretations, yeah, they're not the best. On the section on the right, well, we're seeing beneath this very, very prominent event here, we're seeing a sort of an older sequence there described as uh, volcanic seaward dipping reflectors. I think they're these here right in the bottom right-hand corner. But quite a lot uh, going on in this lower section. Above that, well, we see a sequence where it contains a lot of uh, soul thrusts, so a lot of gravity slides that uh, have then just started backstacking and uh, the formation of all these, these slump deposits. Above that, a very, very irregular surface, and then we go into a more quiescent, sort of sub-parallel bedded sequence, and you can see the occasional pop mark and indeed a very, very shallow channel uh, at the top of that sequence. Now, if you want to see seismic, these are seismic brokers, Canisys uh, Data. We met them at the Africa Conference in London, and you know they seemed surprised when I said, oh, we'll feature your seismic database in, in one of our videos. Well, yeah, there you go. Here it is. And you can see the coverage here. So very, very good for a regional coverage all the way up through the, the Ludras Basin and to the uh, Namib Basin. And we can see that uh, down in the Orange Basin here, a lot more coverage in this region. And here's an example line. It's been kind of compressed, but you can see just to the left of this flag, we can see this anomaly this bright spot. So various things that look quite interesting in this section. And uh, this sort of data would be quite good for the basis of a regional study to try and determine 
where uh, the areas of interest may well be. If we take a quick look now at Namcor, well, you know, if we look at the acreage here, Namcor, the blocks that they're involved in, is shown in yellow here, and effectively they're in every block. And then some more detail about some of the leads and prospects are shown in here, and some of their participating interests in some of these blocks. So you can see they're involved in everything from Kudu, Graf, Venus, Lorona, uh, Yonker, and uh, Lissetti. So quite a lot and since this particular graphic was put together we've had Cullinan, we've had Nara and there's more to come. So in this section we're going to look at, we thought we'd just call it other stuff and let's start with a look at the uh, the government take versus the company take and you can see here's a split again this data comes from a Namcor presentation and uh, if we look at it it's about 36 percent would go to the uh, to, to the oil companies who are the explorers um, drilling the wells and going on to develop them and this is you know this is tax that's paid once there's production but the remainder that's uh, some 74 percent is actually going to the government and the people of Namibia. So that is uh, that is the split. So there's a, a lot of benefit for both the explorers undertaking the risk and for the host government and, and, and host country who will benefit from any, uh, any fines and developments in due course. Now, this was, a, this was a graph that was trying to show, I think, that... Um, that two fields in uh, in Namibia were were actually producing around about the same as the entirety of Norway. Now, uh, this one I kind of suspect the the axis here is in uh, uh, cubic meters, not barrels. It's uh, because we know that at peak, Norway did around about three point four million barrels. So this is uh, effectively a forecast for for just two fields coming on stream. So um, you can see it's very significant and it's getting up to the order of about 500,000 barrels a day, half a million barrels a day production from just two fields. Now, probably what needs to be understood is, as well as the take between the government and exploration and production companies, uh, we can see whether the spend is coming. And here we are in 2022. There's a, a very significant spend coming out through in here. And in fact, throughout this period, we see that there's no free cash flow. In fact, there's no free cash flow until around about 2035. And then as the uh, production ramps up on the various field developments in this model, and this is a model that uh, Reistad have put together, and then you can see that the government take really takes off through the, uh, the, the late 30s and, and into the 40s. And, and this is the time period for all the money to actually come out. So $70 billion dollars due to the government in future revenues, if these fields go ahead. And what effect will this have on the economy? Well, this is an analysis from Woodmac, and you can see here the GDP baseline is, uh, is going on through 2023, where we are now, and uh, sort of this, this sort of slow rise through time out to 2043. But here's the direct and indirect value add that would come from the developments of the oil and gas. So significantly boosting the economy of Namibia with development of these fields. Another area is the number of jobs and where they will be and what they will be. And this is basically in the supply chain. So there's specialist jobs, there's non-specialist jobs, some of them requiring very few skilled workers. And sometimes in other areas, there will be a growing industry. And this will probably be uh, local Namibians taking the majority of these positions. So, as a reward for those who stayed, we want to have a look at some geology. Now, you may remember this. We first showed this in our video we did on Venus. Now, uh, that's been well over 15 months ago, and this is the Venus outline here. And at the time we commented, there do seem to be an awful lot of seismic anomalies stretching some way, particularly over to the west of Venus. And it's probably one of these that, that NARA was located on. Why wouldn't you be drilling a seismic anomaly? Now it's kind of interesting that NARA 1's come in and has not found any oil. Now, why is that? Is it a lack of sand? Is it a lack of hydrocarbon of charge in this region here? What's causing this anomaly? 
Well, it's only really by drilling the wells that you actually are able to calibrate the seismic and the AVOs, uh, which is the amplitude versus offset and, and DHIs, direct hydrocarbon indicators. So the wells will certainly help in understanding how this particular play works. If we look at a section here, and again, this was in our uh, Venus video of about a year ago, and you can see here is Venus here. If you look down the lane here, we see another this red anomaly here, but it's it's definitely not the same. And and what you can see here is that it's actually beneath this upper. There's a sort of a black doublet that runs across the section, and this one lies under or in between the doublet. Venus shown here and highlighted is above it, so there is definitely a, a difference now. One thing that, uh, you know, I have seen in the past, and I'm not suggesting for one minute that's what's happened here, but occasionally you do see that a horizon is, is identified, like this very prominent black upper doublet, and that would be mapped across, probably auto-tracked, because it uh, appears to be such a good reflector to follow. And then perhaps you put on a, a band on either side to actually measure the anomaly. And in that scenario, it could show up on some kind of RMS uh, amplitude map that, yes, that there is an anomaly here at Venus and another anomaly here underneath. Now, I'm not for one moment suggesting that Total Energies and uh, partners didn't spot these differences. Of course they did. But, uh, you know, I have actually seen this in the past where if you just use uh, some of these uh, auto-picked uh, broad bands to actually identify your seismic anomalies, they could look alike but they are completely different. So calibration, that's the phase that they're going through, a dry hole analysis and looking to see what the differences are and what works and what doesn't. So do you want to know more? Well, if you do, we've got all the material you're seeing here. In fact, all the material in every one of our videos in Namibia, all held in our Trove database. So um, if you want to follow the story of uh, how the Namibia region is unfolding, sign up to the channel or indeed sign up for the Trove database. Trove News goes out to subscribers all over the world. They're in all the NOCs, they're in all the majors, the mid caps, the small caps, independents, regulators, supply chain. We see all of the major companies, Lumberger, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, Weatherford, plus a whole myriad of other companies, seismic companies, drilling companies, well management companies, everybody looking in on the channel to understand what's going on. So if you would like to advertise and you want to reach the people, get in touch. Our website, www.firstsom.com. Well, there you have it. Namibia, still, uh, still a very, very busy center. Each of these wells probably costing of the order of um, $200 million just to drill. Lots more to come, and uh, there have been a few setbacks in this last quarter. The uh, Cullinan and the Narawell, probably uh, disappointments, but some good news. The the wells uh, at on or the, the the flow tests on on Venus seem to have been uh, have been very very successful, and uh, we look forward to hearing more information about the oil quality, the API gravity, um, whether there's any. Uh, any nasties in the uh, in the composition? And um, we hope not. And uh, we wish all the explorers in the region every success going forward. Bye for now.